be a be a king. Anywho, uh, welcome to um, part two of functional hemodynamic monitoring. So basically, it's a continuation of what we discussed yesterday. And uh, if I may just um, show you my outline, of course, we need to do a recap of the dynamic indices. And someone asked yesterday about um, application of um, what you're discussing, you know. So I'm going to uh, mention um, the use of the pass oximetry in uh, management of um, hemodynamics. Um, so we look at perfusion index, then plethysmography variability index, and then you look at passive leg raising and what you call end expiratory occlusion test, tidal volume challenge, and a bit of a point of care ultrasound. There's barely anything I could talk about. So right now it is possible to have a continuous measurement of your cardiac output. It was also possible to have your stroke volume on the screen in mLs per beat. Um, it is possible to have your stroke volume variation. So this patient's stroke vo volume variation is 17 and um, they look like they can benefit um, from maybe preload augmentation. Uh, you can get a continuous um, transduction of your central venous saturation I think we'll talk about central venous saturation next week. Um, you can also get your CVP. You can get your um, cardiac index um, as a continuous uh, measurement. You can get your mean arterial pressure. You can get your stroke volume index, right? Um, but I said all these principles, um, or all these measurements are derived from your cardiopulmonary interactions, okay? So like I said, it needs advanced, advanced gadgetry, um, but you'd be surprised um, some of the monitors that are available to us can actually give us stuff like pulse pressure variation. Um, so let's look at how a pulse oximeter works. A pulse oximeter basically works um, and the, um, using the principle of spectrophotometry. Okay, so, um, and the main operating principle is actually the Beer um, Lambert's law, all right? So Beer Lambert's law, these are two scientists, one was called Beer and the other one was called Lambert. And if you remember very well in your undergrad days, or in your form one in uh, Chiromo, we went to the biochemistry lab and we were taking some small glass containers. I think they're calling them cuvettes. And then you put uh, solutions of um, um, varying concentration. And then you're putting them in a machine called spect spectrophotometer where they were shining light of, um, light of a defined wavelength across those cuvettes. And the presence of that solution would actually attenuate the transmission of light from one side uh, across to the other side of those cuvettes. So according to Beer, um, absorbance is directly proportional to the concentration of the light absorbing molecules. So as the concentration increases, then the absorbance increases and what is transmitted across um, to the photodetector is, is reduces. Lambert's law uh, talks about now also absorbance being direct proportional to the distance between the photoemitter and photodetector. So the bigger the distance through which the light has to travel, the higher the, um, the absorbance, for example, okay? And in clinical measurements, um, using spectrophotometry, we are looking at 
um, application in uh, measuring hemoglobin. Um, so you're measuring um, different hemoglobin species because oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin um, have different um, absorbance at specific wavelengths. So you're looking at absorbance across or through various hemoglobin types and also absorbance uh, through pulsatile and non-pulsatile blood flow. Right. Sorry. So for example, when you do pulse oximetry, of course you have your finger in this uh, clip or probe and there's a photo emitter which lies on the nail bed. It shines light through the fingertip and then the light falls on a photo detector. So like I said, you could measure absorbance of hemoglobin, but you can also uh, measure absorbance of the various types of, um, uh, let's say blood components. So for example, you could measure the absorbance of the pulsatile arterial blood. You can measure the absorbance of non-pulsatile arterial blood. You could also measure the absorbance of venous and capillary blood, and you could measure the absorbance of skin and tissue. Uh, I'm not so sure about bone. Okay, so it means you actually can tell how much absorbance is due to pulsatile and how much absorbance is due to non-pulsatile. Such that if um, you use that as your a variable parameter and, and it is fed into a microprocessor, you can actually measure what you call perfusion index. So perfusion index basically is your absorbance of infrared radiation uh, in the pulsatile uh, blood um, in comparison to your infrared radiation absorbance in the non-pulsatile. So the pulsatile is denoted AC and the non-pulsatile is noted as DC. And then you multiply that by 100%. So we say it is the ratio of pulsatile to non-pulsatile blood flow, okay? Um, or you could say it's your pulsatile strength. And many people think that it is a glorified capillary refill, okay? And the range is 0 0.2 to 20%. So zero, zero, sorry, 0 0.3 to 20%. 0 0.3 is when your pulsatile component is very, very uh, small compared to your non-pulsatile um, volume, or 20% is when your pulsatile is really, really big. Um, so you have a bigger proportion of blood in the pulsatile uh, compared to the non-pulsatile uh, fraction, okay? So it means 0 0.3 is like when the patient is very um, vasoconstricted or, uh, you know, they have a stenotic valvular lesion, you know, Reynolds disease or, or a state of um, if they don't, you know, three vas oppressors, for example, uh, or low perfusion states like in shock, where a patient is redirecting uh, the blood from the periphery to the central body compartment. But a bigger percentage of your perfusion index uh, tells you that uh, maybe the patient is vasodilated. So in sepsis, maybe thyrotoxicosis, heavy malformation, anemia, regurgitant valvular lesion, and many other um, situations that give you a bigger pulsatile strength. So again, it's been shown that your perfusion index actually changes cyclically with respiration in the same manner as your pulse pressure does change with your respiration. So monitoring of your perfusion index can sometimes uh, be used um, as a surrogate of perfusion where pulse pressure cannot be done because we said pulse pressure needs a direct uh, arterial uh, line uh, pressure transduction. So you could substitute this with this. But you know here, maybe the errors may be bigger than here. But 
um, you could start here. So you could then that cyclic change in perfusion index can be used to calculate what you call your plethysmography variability index. Okay, so PVI is your peak perfusion index minus your minimum perfusion index divided by your maximum perfusion index times 100. Of course, again, um, more than 13%, the patient can benefit from preload augmentation. Less than 10%, that patient uh, won't benefit from preload augmentation because the, there's little variation here because you know when the PVI is less than 10%, there's little variation. Uh, when the PVA is more than 13%, um, there's very high fluctuation in terms of your perfusion index. Between 10 and 13 is your gray zone. Okay, yeah, you could wait and repeat the measurement. Uh, it can worsen or improve. Okay, so basically, um, there's a little difference between the calculation of PVI. Uh, from the calculation of uh, pass pressure variation or stroke volume variation, because you realize the denominator was the mean of maximum and minimum of variables. But here, uh, we just use the, uh, the maximum. We don't calculate the mean uh, of the two uh, as your denominator here. So basically, we could mm -hmm. use the plethysmography variability index as a replacement for invasive uh, situation, uh, parameters like pass pressure variation or stroke volume variation one, because of course they're invasive and they're not readily um, available. So um, one of the things that we use to check for the, um, or predict the need for preloads augmentation is by using what you call the passive leg raise test, all right? So what happens is that, again, this patient must be hooked to a monitor that does continuous cardiac output or cardiac index, okay? Or, or, yeah, or, you know, sometimes we hook it to a monitor that does pass pressure variation, for example. So, um, this patient initially will be positioned in the semi-recumbent um, or 45 degrees. And then after a while, we turn, we flip them so that the head comes down and the lower limbs go up. This is at 45 degrees. So what happens is that you auto transfuse um, the central compartment with a bolus that is equivalent to around four cc's per kg. So if somebody is 70 kilos and you do the passive leg raise, um, they actually um, transfuse themselves with around 250 cc's. Okay, so that is an endogenous um, bolus. So you expected to see a change in um, cardiac index of more than 13%, or if you do your pass pressure, the pass pressure variation should be more than 13%, okay? What happens is that you measure your pulse pressure when you're in the same recumbent position. So if the guy is making maybe a systolic of eight, 90 and a diastolic of 60, the pulse pressure will be 30. When you do this, it's been shown that the systolic pressure increases more than the diastolic pressure. So maybe the systolic pressure goes to 110 and the diastolic pressure goes to maybe uh, 65. So the new pulse pressure will be maybe 45. So what's the difference between your uh, first uh, pass pressure and your second pass pressure? So it will be 45 minus 30, that is 15, divided by the original pass pressure, which is 30. So 15 divided by 30 times 100, that's um, almost 50%. So you can say this patient will actually benefit from um, um, preload augmentation, okay? So sometimes it is good to administer or uh, to predict uh, the need for fluids 
before you actually do the augmentation. So why is passive leg raising test um, um, a good thing to do? One, of course, it's an endo endogenous bolus. It's endogenous so that if a patient doesn't uh, like it or react adversely, or they, go, they go into chest congestion, um, you can actually reverse it by sitting that patient up in the same recumbent position. But when you give 250 of saline or ringers or gelofusin, uh, it cannot be reversed. So you have to give Lasix, uh, which takes time to, to, you know, hoping that this patient is Lasix responsive, because there's patients who are not Lasix uh, responsive, they're diuretic response, um, resistance. There's something called diuretic resistance. So you're hoping that this is not only for patients, okay? Um, passive leg raise test is actually very good in that it is independent of ventilation status. Most of the dynamic indices have to be done when the patient is on positive pressure ventilation at a tidal volume of around eight, eight cc's per kg and in sinus rhythm and with a fairly normal lung compliance. But here, passive leg raising can be done whether you're breathing on the machine or spontaneously, and whether your lung compliance is good or bad, and it doesn't matter whether you're in cardiac dysrhythmia, okay? So a person who has um, atrial fibrillation can still be monitored with passive leg raising test. Now, this is what you call the receiver operating characteristic curve. This is a curve that is used to create um, cutoffs for let's say um, segregating uh, responders from non-responders. So when the area under the curve is closer to one, you know, this whole square, the area under the curve is supposed to be one, but with the passive leg raising test, it's actually very close to one because it is a whole of this area, area under the whole of this curve. Uh, so it is very close to one. So it performs very well in its ability to pick responders from non-responders when they are given this endogenous fluid balance, a uh, fluid baller, sorry. Um, so it has a very high specificity and uh, sensitivity. However, it may not work very well uh, in situation where the intra-abdominal pressure is um, elevated. The other thing that can be done with patients who are on mechanical ventilation is actually to do an end expiratory occlusion test. Um, towards the end of your expiration, you actually may do an end expiratory pause. You just give them a prolonged expiratory pause for nearly 15 um, seconds. And this will actually interrupt the impediment to venous return that is um, induced by this positive pressure ventilation. We said the other day, when uh, during inspiration in mechanical ventilation, the intrathoracic pressure goes up and it limits your venous return. So if you put a pause at the end of expiration, it means you withhold the mechanical insufflation. You withhold the increase in your intrathoracic pressure and so you interrupt that impediment to venous return. And what happens is that you allow some time for the cardiac preload to augment. <clears throat> and so if you notice a change in your cardiac index or cardiac output or pulse pressure uh, variation or you know, stroke volume variation by more than 5%, then you can say this patient is preload responsive and then may benefit from an additional fluid bolus, okay? So you realize that the mechanical ventilator, because it's the biggest thing that we do in the ICU, is not just um, for the respiratory system, it's not just for breathing, uh, it is also for assessment of preload uh, status. So those mechanics in Kenya who are making cars, they've just realized that there's money in mechanical ventilation uh, at the now started the manufacturing. We hope those new ventilators that they're making can also do this kind of work.
All right. What happens is that most of, if not all, of our patients currently are being ventilated with a tidal volume of six ml per kilo. And we said the accuracy of our dynamic indices is optimum when the tidal volume is eight cc's per kg. So um, it therefore means that if we use, continue using the small tidal volume, then we cannot use that to predict the need um, for additional fluid, all right? So what happens is that we could actually do what you call a tidal volume challenge. You will look at your pass pressure variation or stroke volume variation when the patient is on a small tidal volume of six. But because this patient is uh, ARGS, they cannot be ventilated with a, a tidal volume of eight. You actually give them that tidal volume of eight cc's per kilo for like one whole minute. And then you observe the change in pass pressure variation. If that pass pressure variation goes up by more than 3.5%, you could say that that patient is preload responsive and they may benefit from fluid, okay? So you do a challenge, tidal volume of six to a tidal volume of eight, and then you go back to six. If the change in pulse pressure is more than uh, three and a half percent, you can um, comfortably give a fluid bolus. Yeah, so we always have been looking at um, indices of measuring dynamic, um, or rather dynamic indices for monitoring your hemodynamics. And um, of course we say they're all based on the principle of cardiopulmonary interaction. The same same principle happens when you look at your inferior vena cava, uh, and uh, you, if you observe the inferior vena cover, actually the diameter moves or changes cyclically with your respiration. So during inspiration and when the patient is breathing spontaneously, um, again, um, if the patient is dehydrated, the walls of the inferior vena cover nearly kiss and then they um, increase in diameter during expiration. So again, you get cyclic chains in your inferior vena cover diameter with respiration. So if you put a probe um, uh, in the subcephoid region uh, in a longitudinal uh, manner with the orientation marker facing the head, uh, you'll actually uh, be able to visualize your inferior vena cover. Uh, like here, and then this is what you call the M mode. So it shows you the cyclic variation in your inferior vena cover, right? So there are some indices that you can actually calculate um, using your inferior vena cover diameters. So when your patient is breathing spontaneously, we calculate what you call inferior vena cover collapsibility index. And it's your maximum diameter, which happens during expiration, minus your minimum diameter, which happens during expiration, divided by your maximum diameter, which happens during expiration. So you multiply that by 100. If your inferior vena cover collapsibility index is more than 50%, the patient is preload uh, responsive. Okay, we said collapsibility index is for spontaneously breathing patients. Because of reversal uh, of your transpulmonary pressures during mechanical ventilation, then we don't use inferior vena cover collapsibility index in that situation. We use inferior vena cover distensibility index. So basically, it is your maximum diameter minus your minimum diameter, but you replace your denominator with your minimum diameter. If your inferior vena cover distensibility index is more than 15, then the patient is preload responsive. Right, like I said, this is useful in patients who are um, uh, on intermittent positive pressure ventilation. Okay, so basically, when you